All right, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Brad Barbeau. I am the outgoing executive director of the CSUMB Institute for Innovation and Economic Development. And I've been leading this event now for almost 15 years. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to see all of the finalists and friends and family and uh, onlookers. I hope you've had a great time looking at these great tables, great displays that everybody did, uh, and all of the great businesses from this year. I want to start out by uh, reading the CSUMB land acknowledgments. Cal State Monterey Bay resides on the indigenous homeland of the Ama, Mutsun, Esalen, Ohlone, Rumson, and Salinan people and territories. It is on these rich homelands where CSUMB not only thrives as an institution of higher education, but also provides an education abundant with service and experience to a diverse community of learners. As our students, staff, faculty, alumni, and community members Explore the university's campus. Remember to respect the land and take note of the natural beauty. Remember that ancestors rest below the pathways and in other less traveled areas on campus. We are here. Let Kalai. With that, I want to ask uh, Dean Mary Lou Shockley to come to the podium. I saw her a moment ago. Okay. There you are. Okay. There we go. Um, honored to do, introduce the Dean of the College of Business here at Cal State Monterey Bay, Mary Lou Shockley, to welcome everyone. Well, thank you. This is Paul so I've got to bring this microphone down. Um, again, one of the things I'm looking at right out there is just a wonderful sea of color, balloon celebration, and I think that's creativity that's just unbelievably uh, vital. So again, let's give an applause to all of those that made, made it the, made this a wonderful event. This is about the time I get to brag a little bit about the uh, e the IIED. And um, this institute is called the Institute of Innovation and Economic Development, uh, is one of the crown jewels of the College of Business. Uh, it meets the core values of the College of Business, which is um, responsible business. And responsible business is defined by people, planet, and of course ethics, and uh, also uh, profit, that's always important, and equity. So I want to also uh, acknowledge someone in the audience here who helped us put this uh, mission together, and that's our founding dean. Uh, Dean um, Sean Comet. Stand up, Sean. And it's 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 because of this event that uh, we are are here today. But even more important is important is that even this particular event really uh, magnifies and the college mission as I see it. Uh, this is the 15th year in which we've done the Startup Challenge, and there's so many businesses that have come through that have been successful, and I think that is a wonderful a tri a tribute to those here today, and to those that have come in for the challenge uh, as, as a new business today. So I think we should congratulate those that have made the effort, really, to put themselves out to apply and to, to do their pitches today. So let's give them a round of applause as well. So I'm not going to go on forever here because we do have a shorter program. And uh, I'd like to just return um, Brad to the podium. 
uh, so that he can introduce our guest speaker today. So without further ado, there is Brad. I'll raise this up for you, Brad. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have a very special speaker today, uh, special for <coughs> knowledge and special for his speaking ability. Uh, he's a scintillating speaker, if you will. Uh, Craig Bachon has an illustrious background as an entrepreneur, executive, and author. You should read his books, they're wonderful. Uh, Craig has been a great supporter of CSU Monterey Bay and is a member of the IIED Advisory Council. Currently the CEO at AI Redefined. AI is a big deal these days, will continue to be a big deal for a very long time. He's working at the cutting edge of technology and society and has some very interesting thoughts about the future of education and entrepreneurship. Please give a warm welcome to Craig. We live in an era of exponential growth, especially when we think about technology. The hardest thing in the world is to explain what is exponential. So I like to do so with an analogy. If we found a piece of paper big enough that we could fold it in half 50 times, would that be 10 inches wide? Would that be 10 feet wide? Would that be 10 miles wide? Any guesses? Any size. You can fold that. It doesn't matter. Any size. Any size? <laughs> if you're folding it in half, it's 93 million miles wide. If you fold a piece of paper 50 times in half, it's 93 million. It's from here to our sun. Burning paper. Yes. <laughs> the reason I bring this up is because change is happening so quickly today in terms of technology. It is an exponential style growth. And in so much, it's really hard for us, much like to imagine folding a piece of paper 50 times. It's really hard for us to imagine what the future holds. I think it's really kind of fun to think about what the future holds. I am blessed because I get to work in technology and you know, I think back to the, the early days when I, I first heard what a cellular phone was. That's where I started. When cellular phones were installed in cars, because you couldn't carry them, they were too heavy. Right? My very first computer had 2,300 transistors in it. It cost $12,000. This has 25 billion, with a B, transistors in it, and it costs $1,200. So where are we going? Right? Because things are changing so quickly, and we're in an educational institution, a really fine one. So what does it mean? I work in artificial intelligence. And in this particular field, the change is happening so rapidly that I actually caught one of my staff members a number of weeks ago. She turned to me and said, Craig, in the old days, like four weeks ago, we used to... And, and that's very true of where technology is today. And so any of us pundits who try to predict the future are going to look foolish. Because it's going to move so fast, maybe we don't fully understand or comprehend what the ramifications might be.
But with regard to education, I, I was uh, very fortunate in part of my career to teach at Harvard University. And, you know, I was a young kid and I was shocked at how smart everybody was. But the reality is, that was a very different teaching style 40 years ago than it is today. Right? 40 years ago, we would talk about um, you know, methods and processes that had been developed in the last 10 years. Today, we talk about methods and processes that might be 10 months old. Right? We're not talking about how to use generative AI. We're talking about when and how much and what's appropriate. Because if you're not using Gen AI, you're probably going to be lapped. <laughs> right? And so we need to perhaps think about how that changes uh, uh, education, for one. Education in the past was, you know, we're going to give you a set of skills that would allow you to succeed. Um, but today, the set of skills that we might be teaching in education might be the old, you know, it might be considered the old days in as little as a year or two. So the classes that people took as a freshman and sophomore, by the time they graduate, may be required a completely different set of instructions. And I think that, you know, AI is going to compound this problem. <coughs> Today, we build AI pilot instructors for eVTOLs. eVTOLs are those nice flying taxis for Joby, Archer, and, 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 and Supernova. And the challenge that those industries face is they need to get from zero, actually that's not true, there are three certified pilots to fly eVTOLs today. They need to go from three to somewhere around 40,000 pilots by the year 2030. Now in the old days, yesterday, <laughs> you literally had to have a pilot train with another pilot, a trainee and a trainor. That's not going to work. You can't do the math to get to 40,000 people from three today. It doesn't math. You can't do it. So now we apply artificial intelligence and a process called adaptive learning, where the artificial intelligence uses a, an evaluator, a known curriculum, and a director, three different AI agents. And the evaluator looks at what you do as a trainee. And it maybe does so on a like really rudimentary simulation, like Microsoft simulation for, for, for flying an airplane. Right? And it starts you there and, and it determines your proficiencies where you're good at stuff and where you're not. And then the curriculum and the evaluator will work together and sort of say, yeah, this is where this person is good at their skills and this is where they might need some, some strengthening. And then the director, in a hyper-personalized fashion, changes <coughs> what it's teaching based on your specific skills and weaknesses but even does so in a more elegant fashion in the sense that it learns how you best learn. Some of us learn experientially. I'm one of those people. Some people need audio or visual, right? Some of us learn differently. So we also have to teach differently. And that's going to change many things in education. So, over the next few years, and I think it's going to be very few years, I do think artificial intelligence 
has a role to play even in universities and colleges like this one. I think what we'll see is a curriculum that changes pretty rapidly because our world around us is changing pretty rapidly. A curriculum that is tailored to your proficiencies, right? Understanding how you best learn and mapping that curriculum. So we all have the same curriculum, but mapping that to how you best learn. And I think college will need to change, you know, hypothetically to something a whole lot shorter than it is today. Right? Maybe two or three years of college, what we traditionally called college. And the next 20 or so years where you stay attached to an AI that helps you evolve in your learnings because the world around us is evolving. Right? If we think about what the next 20 or 30 years are, I'm absolutely certain, and I'm an investor in small companies, and I saw about two weeks ago a barbecue-sized fusion reactor producing more energy than it was taking in to create the magnetic to hold that fusion reaction. What's our world going to be like if energy has no cost? Cool. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. It's going to be different. What's it going to be like if I can create an AI for you and you can sell it a dozen or a hundred or ten thousand times? to different businesses. That's, that's really close to the horizon today. We can build a gen AI large language model that speaks identically to your, your, your body of work. I saw a deep fake this morning of myself singing Mustang Sally. <laughs> How many know the song Mustang Sally? Yeah. yeah. It is my go-to karaoke song. I haven't done karaoke in 20 years, but it's my go-to karaoke song if ever forced to do this. And I saw a deep fake of me singing Mustang Sally, and I couldn't tell the difference. I had no... There was nothing. The fidelity was so good that I couldn't tell the difference of, was it me or was it a deep thing? It had my vocal intonations, it had my awkward pauses. I, everything about it was me. I wish they had made it skinnier and better looking, <laughs> right? But they didn't. So, how does our world change? Well, one, in education, we need to teach the really important stuff. I'd argue the really important stuff is, how do we best learn? Right? How do we best learn new things is critical. Second, critical thinking. Because, by the way, this AI can be used for good. It can also be used for not good. Just like a kitchen knife, 99.999969s use a kitchen knife for good. We make dinner with it. Occasionally it's used to harm other human beings. Right? We don't blame the kitchen knife. We blame the person that wields it. AI today is kind of a tool. In the future, it may be more than a tool. One of the best TED Talks I heard this year, if, if you want to go uh, on YouTube and look at a TED Talk by um, Mustafa Suleiman. Um, Mustafa did a TED Talk in April, and he basically said, 
We need to stop fooling around. He used a better F word than fooling. He basically said, AI is us. It's a new us. But we have created, by having it mimic us, something that is us. For the good, the bad, the kind, the unkind, the worthy, the unworthy. We have created an AI that reflects who we are, sometimes creative, sometimes not. Sometimes hallucinating, sometimes not. And if we think about that earlier analogy of my first computer to this computer, and Moore's law that says our processing power increases by 2x every two years, holy shit. It's going to be a lot smarter than us someday. Now, that doesn't mean it replaces us. If we're smart about it, and where I focus all of my attention today is on this issue of human AI alignment. Human AI alignment is around this concept that unless AI is helpful to humans, it doesn't have a place in our world. If it doesn't augment our intelligence, then it doesn't really belong with us. It's either helpful, or we don't need it. And so how do we build, that's the tools that I like to build, how do we build tools that will, in fact, allow humans to always have a substantial voice in AI? And those kinds of tools arguably are going to be more and more necessary because both AI and humans benefit. AI doesn't understand what it is to be a human. Six years ago when Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg decided to set up one of the very first AI algorithms at Facebook, they wanted to increase engagement. And the AI was freaking so good at it. Increased engagement by 21%. When we did a retrospective of how it increased engagement, it did so at the cost of polarization, hate speech, misogyny, racial tension, all the bullshit in the world that doesn't help humanity. And that's why human AI alignment has to be critical. We need humans to, through creating multi-agency reinforcement learning and real-time continuous human feedback, we need humans to be a part of the solution, to train AI as to what's really important to us. Because AI is kind of like a, a toddler. <laughs> 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 You know, I saw a cookie over there. I'm going to get the cookie. <laughs> right? And so the reality is we are going to be stewards of AI. It is us. It is reflective of who we are. And whether that we think about that through education or thinking about that through um, entrepreneurship, our worlds are going to change so rapidly. The best thing that each of us can do is prepare for that and know that you know, we'll need to adapt with it, that none of us are smart enough to know what it's going to look like in three and five and ten years. But if we have critical thinking skills and we know how to learn and we have institutions that are set up to help us continually learn for the foreseeable future, that's probably a pretty good solution.
And so I don't know if I'm near my 20 minutes or not, Brad, but uh, you know, I'll take any questions or thoughts, concerns. Yes. Oh, that's a question. Isn't AI in our world right now sure. that we're experiencing and may not know it or <clears throat> going to be in our world in the next three months? I'll stick with the first one. Isn't AI in our world right now? So part of the challenge, of course, is like, how do we define AI? So rudimentary AI is in our world today. If you are interacting with a chatbot on a website, you're not really talking to a human. You're talking with a rudimentary AI. If you are experimenting with Gen AI on things like ChatGPT, if you're playing around with any of the really cool image or video generators, that's starting to be real AI. Um, the reality is if it's helping humanity, I don't think we need to know if it's AI or not. The only time I get really worried about it is when it's not helpful to humanity. And do we have the processes and mechanisms in place to make sure that it is? Brad? So my question on that, how do we know, do we know when it's being helpful to humanity or not? Yeah, um, you know, one of the toughest, I was uh, speaking at Santa Cruz Works a month or so ago, and, you know, some very passionate, adamant, very smart woman said, I want these LLMs to only tell me the truth. And I thought, you know, go study Kierkegaard, because, you know, my truth and your truth and your truth and your truth are all different. We don't share truths per se, right? Especially today in our political environment, right? Where it can get pretty squirrely pretty fast. And so, you know, how do we know when, it's, when it goes bad? It's really the only time we know, uh, and, and I, I think, you know, we're starting to see it. Canadian Airlines um, recently had a chatbot that made promises that the company couldn't keep, and they ended up, you know, throwing a whole lot, I think it was close to three or four million dollars at the person who, you know, they weren't able to keep those promises. Those are the things that fix things pretty quick, right, when it goes wrong. And, you know, at this point, there are only a few rogue nations in the world that are using AI in defense. Most people are using AI to ensure that humans, you know, here, I, I work at Naval Postgraduate School. I guarantee you the, you know, the, the most important aspect that they're thinking is around safety and around ensuring that humans make decisions. Why? Because AI shouldn't be making those kinds of lethal decisions ever. John, you're great. Uh, so Nick Bostrom and Stuart Russell and these guys worry about AGI running them up. All right? Yeah. And so uh, uh, given, uh, you know, we, we all live in a totally decentralized, to your point, about uh, my truth is not your truth, the character of the coin. Uh, it's possible that AGI, which uh, it's growing exponentially, yep. can become evil. Right? Sure. So, so and, and blow up the world. So, rewind that part. That leap I'm not, that syllogistic leap I'm not willing to take. Yeah, I, I think... So, um, so what's to prevent that? Uh, how do we know that we don't know the existing yeah. question whether it's good or bad? So uh, for those that may not be familiar with the term AGI, yeah. AI is artificial intelligence. AGI is artificial general intelligence. It's that moment where we can't tell the difference 
between an AI and a human. AGI is superlative to humans in their ability to think, rationalize, and, 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 and do a number of other uh, really interesting tasks. Today, AI is that toddler. Right? If you ask ChatGPT to play chess with you, any of us can play chess. We probably all know the rudimentary rules. We know that rooks move you know, north-south and never diagonal, right? Um, if you play chess with ChatGPT, the third or fourth move in, they're going to give you the most brilliant opening that has won more times than anywhere else and that everybody has written about gives you this brilliant opening, and then the third or fourth move, they forget where the pieces are. <laughs> and they move the rook diagonally. And the answer really is that today, AI hasn't got enough contextual understanding and enough ability to reason. Right? We, we, AI's shit at showing causality. Why? Because it requires a huge, I mean, the beauty of humans, we understand context. It's one of the things that we really understand really well, and AI is the worst at context. So AGI needs to first broach that very important moat. And we think it probably will in, you know, a few years, some people think, and uh, you know, some people, some very smart people, um, you know, depending upon definitions, think it may be longer than 10 years. But it's going to happen. And the question isn't like, can it turn evil? I think, of course, any tool can be used to harm humanity. The question then is like, do we build the right safeguards, the right human alignment into these tools at the foundational level so that we can ensure that we can steer AI, right? Because even like truth, ethics is very, very personal, hyper-personal. My wife is the most honest human being in the world. She's in Whole Foods. She steals grapes like nobody's business. <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing it down, my wife. Right? She should not steal grapes from Whole Foods. But, you know, I, I think much like um, uh, uh, humans, we're all going to have our own sense of what's right, what's wrong, what's feasible, what's infeasible, and we need an AI to have the ability to steer it. The one assumption that Jan LeCun, he's the head of AI at Meta, and Meta has taken a very open source approach, thankfully, um, is that open source will probably um, make more contextual awareness, and therefore be at par or better than the closed source environments. In the closed source environments, there may be directed teaching. In the open source environments, there'll tend to be democratic thinking, which is much how, if you haven't read A Thousand Brains by Jeff Hawkins, read Jeff Hawkins, A Thousand Brains, if this is interesting to you, because it's our, how our cerebral cortex the thing that makes us different than our dogs, this tiny little napkin sized piece of our brain, postulates a million different predictions and then picks one. That is a democratic um, kind of in our own brains. And that's how we as humans work, and I would argue that's how the best AGI will eventually work. Am I getting the hook? <laughs> Very thought-provoking. I think we're all going to spend a lot of time thinking about, worrying about 
from AI as we go forward, and hopefully we'll find a way to actually think about it going forward. Slide, and now it is time to get to the awards, what you all came here for. Yeah. start by thanking the rather large number of people that it takes to put on this event each year, starting with the design committee and staff. I want to call out specifically Mary Jo Zank. Here we go. And uh, Jonathan Bagley Rowe. You, all the participants, know Jonathan well because they get emails from him a couple of times a day uh, with more information and things they're supposed to do and forms they're supposed to fill out and places they're supposed to be and all that. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of, of effort and they've been supported by, uh, on the right, our, our student uh, assistants and this, our, our, our uh, our interns, and I think some of them are here. Kate, where's Kate? Uh, Kate's hiding. Come on up front, Kate, and say hello to everybody. Uh, the other two are not currently here, Lilia or Verna. Okay, cool. It takes an amazing number of judges and mentors to run this. I was amazed when I put this list together. Oh, wow, were there really that many? Yes, there were that many. Uh, that it takes who have worked at the qualifying round, worked with the finalists in between the qualifying round and the, uh, the today's finals. The, the final pitches were in the morning. Uh, a big thank you to all of those folks for all the contributions they made to these startup businesses. Startup Challenge is hosted by uh, CSU Monterey Bay, organized by the CSUMB Institute for Innovation and Economic Development, that's us. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors, Link2, our diamond sponsor, who has sponsored the uh, Venture Prize this year, again, second year in a row that they have done that. Our platinum and gold sponsors, Blue Tech Valley Accelerator, uh, out of Fresno State. Brookshire Properties, uh, and the Institute for Innovation and Economic Development Advisory Council. Silver and Braun, White Summer, uh, law firm who's been a huge supporter of the Startup Challenge for many years now. Wells Fargo, uh, Cal Global Education, the Federal Home Loan Bank, First Capital Bank, of course CSUMB, and Pinnacle Bank. All of these Companies are huge supporters and are really helpful in helping these companies get started in our region. Let's give them a nice <laughs> uh, So our marketing and media sponsors, partners, KZU, and I really want to recognize the uh, Monterey County Weekly. They have been a part of the uh, Startup Challenge since its beginning, so they've been a sponsor now for 15 years straight. Very cool. Of course, congratulations to all our finalists, and I would say not only all of our finalists, but all of the 52 companies that entered the Startup Challenge this year. We began with 52 companies, we whittled it down at the qualifying round to 20 finalists, uh, those finalists pitched this morning, and in a moment we'll find out who are the winners of this year. Uh, this is 15 years of Startup Challenge. Those of us who have been around since the beginning are feeling a little older. <laughs> uh, these are some of the companies that have been out there, some really cool companies. Uh, Yoderm, who won in 2012. Uh, started by two young guys just out of college. They put an idea together to do online dermatology. They turned that into a business and they sold that business to Hims and Hers in 2021 for $150 million. So they were very successful at that company. Uh, Heavy Connect in the world of ag tech uh, started uh, uh, about 10 years.
years ago now, uh, and still going, still very successful. Uh, Cruz Home up in Santa Cruz, uh, helping to rid the world of plastic, but more importantly, Little Feet here uh, in, in our area, uh, also replacing bubble wrap with paper version of bubble wrap. And all these other companies, many of them, uh, some of you may be familiar with Mises Gluten-Free Bakery uh, over on uh, Soledad in Monterey. They've been incredibly successful. Miss Lippy's Dumplings, you can find uh, Emily and her dumplings at uh, many um, farmers markets around, including the old Monterey market. Uh, uh, the Lavender Creek Company making incredible products from lavender. They've been, I, I, I love this story. So this is the story of an entrepreneur. So um, when they were going through Startup Challenge, actually, uh, this is a couple, and, and uh, she was, was pregnant at the time, and a little ways after Startup Challenge, uh, she went to the shop to have a child, and of course, her husband, Ryan, went in with her. And, but he took a little detour, he had to go to the gift shop. And he not only got her some flowers, at least I hope he got her some flowers, because mostly what he came out of the gift shop with was an order for their lavender products to be in the gift shops. That's an entrepreneur. Uh, many births happening at the same time. So these are great companies that have been added to the region by the Startup Challenge. We've had over a thousand companies come through the challenge. Uh, those companies have gone on and raised to our best count $154 million in follow-on funding. I wish we'd given them, but we don't have that much money. They have not raise that externally. And have created over 600 jobs. That's a hard number to come up with. I would guess that is a way under count, but at least 600 jobs that have been created. So the Startup Challenge and the companies that come through here have a huge economic and quality of life impact on our region. The challenge has four divisions, venture for large companies, social venture for uh, not-for-profits and companies focused on their social mission, Main Street for small companies, and students for, wait for it, students! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're now going to go through and present the winners of each of these divisions. We'll begin with the student division. So this is open to students at all levels, from middle school up through graduate school, and we have had all of those uh, participate uh, through the years in the Startup Challenge. And... Drum roll. <laughs> so, the, uh, oh, we've got to do the finalists first. The four finalist companies, Tallyroos, Metamorphosis, I've got my metamorphosis skin on because they were smart enough to hand me one this morning and told me if I took it off, they'd beat me up. <laughs> uh, Love, Maddie, and Velocity Auto Spa. And now we can do the drum roll. And the winner is... Careful, what do you need to call? Careful up here. Because this, uh, the prize for the student division is sponsored by... Dr. Tao, who is the original director of the IIAD, so he's the guy who started all this. I just got to take it and, and work with it. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> Institute for Global Education, that's his wife's business. Right. Okay. The grand prize goes to Tallyroos. Uh, the 10 second version of what, what's Tallyrus about? <laughs> Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. Uh, so I'm Yatham, and this is Ashwin, and we're presenting Tallyrus. And Tallyrus is a web application to help teachers grade their students' essays using <laughs> <laughs> or not-for-profit not uh, organizations but are, who are focused on achieving a social mission. They may serve, they may have a for-profit arm, but are they, where they're serving 
uh, private needs also, uh, but the key is that they are focused around a social mission. Our finalists this year, Motivan Bando Corazones Consulting, uh, Mother Tree, Steam and Robotics, and Drive, and the winner is, are we ready? Caregivers and children. 
um, will feature food and beverage, classes, and a rental party space. Thank you so much. Whole outcome, a, a part of doing this is, is helping these companies and crowning a winner, which is always fun. But a lot of it is the networking that happens in here. And so, I, I, here's a really fabulous example of this. Just happened in real time here. Rooted Wonder and uh, Steam have been invited to uh, have a joint uh, booth, a pop up, at, the, at this year's uh, Concorso Italiano. Which will be a huge opportunity to go to the next one. That's why we do this. Yes. All right. And to the venture division, open to scalable investable businesses. These will be the, the next uh, uh, Yoderm and the next Little Feet out there. Uh, sponsored by Link2, uh, Bill Sars, uh, the head of Link2, is not able to make it today. Uh, the finalists were uh, Pacific Paleontology, uh, Evie, Align, and Bike Garage, and the, no, the, the, I think this one we're going to say, yes, thank you very much, and so congratulations to Align! Pardon? It's light so it's a line. It's a line. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, the, the app is a line, the brand is like uh, Vegas. Okay. Cool. Uh, the other thing is, you know, these companies are early stage, they go through name changes. From <laughs> <laughs> Monday to <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but it's a fabulous. So Align by Life Sages is making hyper personalized mind body wellness a reality for all at all life stages. So we use EcoML and AI to make sure that we hyper personalize wellness interventions for your unique wellness journey to make sustainable wellness a reality for all. So we have runners up, first runner up, Ivy. through them, three people. The first is uh, Brooks McChesney. He's not here today. He's in Ireland, but that's okay. We still want to honor him. Uh, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur that has, uh, has been part of this team since its inception and has done a wonderful job working as a judge, as a mentor, and uh, he has also um, been an advisor for us over the 15 years. He was a key advisor for the uh, the uh, Yoderm uh, startup, and of course we talked about that a minute ago, but he's also been um, a, a, an advisor to some, 
It's a little company called Carmel Honey uh, that was started by, get this, a seventh grader. And uh, by the time um, uh, the, the, co the company uh, began to grow, it was over a million dollars by the time he graduated from high school. That's, a, that's an accomplishment. And Brooks was there as, a, as an angel to help and mentor all the way through the process. And again, let's just give him a round of applause. He's not here today. And uh, we have another wonderful person, and, and he is here today. Eric, are you here somewhere? I know you are. I'm over here. Hi. Come on up. Woo! Yeah, this guy, this guy is just fabulous. I believe I was a teenager when this started. Yes, you were. <laughs> Let me brag on you a little bit before we give you this award. Uh, Chuck, um, again, you, you've been a successful entrepreneur yourself, and uh, you've had a wonderful man uh, career, and of course uh, worked at the, uh, in, uh, at the San Jose Incubator for many, many years. But the most important thing is that he's come down here very consistently. <laughs> And he's done pitch workshops for us for, uh, during the Startup Challenge for years and years and coached a hun hundreds of startups uh, to help them master their pitches. So we're just very, very grateful for Chuck and all of the work that he's done to make this event possible and wonderful. Chuck, thank you so much. just an inspiration to so many students over the years. He has, uh, has been the driving force in the College of Business behind entrepreneurship when it was only one person, and it was him. So over the years, uh, he's been uh, just uh, the person that uh, we had that, uh, that uh, really fostered the whole notion of entrepreneurship. And of course, took on the challenge of the Startup Challenge. So we are just so grateful for, for what uh, he has done over the years. He's been consistent. He's been a cheerleader. He has been just an all-around great guy. So let's just give him a round of applause. Thank you. as I leave the stage. So I'm sure he's going to come up with something very, very fine, for which I will give him it back right after the meeting. Thank you. So I do want to say a couple of things really quickly. So I, I said at the beginning I am the outgoing executive director. I will be retiring from Cal State Monterey Bay uh, at the end of this semester. Uh, I am not retiring from life. I am not planning to go play golf for the rest of my life by any means. I plan to stay very involved in the startup world and in economic development in the, in the region. But I want to acknowledge the people who have been really critical as we've run the Institute and the Startup Challenge uh, through the years, uh, starting with uh, one set of partners in crime, Chuck Erickson, Brooks McChesney, and others who got this started 15 years ago now and have supported this all through the years. Uh, Chuck has been tireless in doing the pitch workshops over all these years, and Brooks has been an absolutely exemplary 
advisor to many companies along the way. I also want to want to acknowledge my predecessor, uh, Eric Dow, the original director of the Institute, who got this started, who made the mistake of bringing me in, uh, and but taught me the ropes, uh, and hopefully I have taken his legacy and, and done some good job with over it over the years. Uh, and my partner in crime with the Institute over the last 10 years um, that really helped build it, uh, Sean Thomas, who without Sean Thomas, um, and then the person who has been my right-hand person in making the Institute work and who has really done all the work, I'm just the figurehead, that is, of course, Mary Jo Sang. All right. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, special thanks to, of course, our sponsor, LinkedIn, Blue Tech, Brookshire Properties. Thank you for bringing our best, best, where, where is Isabel going? Here. Oh, she's <laughs> hiding. <laughs> And thank you for bringing your daughter. That was very fun having her here. Also, uh, the advisory council, including uh, recognizing Craig. Thank you for that great talk. Very thought provoking. Uh, our other sponsors who have, have supported us uh, this year and previous years. Uh, congratulations again to the reason that we do this, which is the participants. Uh, the winners are great, but it, this is all about helping these uh, early entrepreneurs get started, get rolling. Uh, so thank you all very much. And, okay. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> all right, so we have a crowd favorite prize. Everybody have a great weekend and a great year. Take care.